Good morning, church family. Hope you guys are well rested. I woke up this morning and my allergy, I know it's springtime when the allergies start coming. Also when my house is a little bit more warm um, than usual. But yeah, I woke up this morning and just the allergies have been getting to me. I used to be an allergy free person actually. I was immune and I was confident in that and I loved it because growing up, um, my mom, uh, my mother Lupe, she had the craziest allergies. You, when she sneezed, you heard it from like a mile away. It was super embarrassing. I hated going to the grocery store with her. I'm like, mom, stop, please. Um, it was just so loud every time she would sneeze and I would like, um, my mom would just be like, you know, you just better be happy that you're not like me. Well, then I went to PUC, and in PUC, there's, at PUC, there's just so much pollen, so much everywhere that you could, you could see it, not only smell it, and I think it kind of started attacking my immune system, so now I'm just like allergy prone to everything, so um, I'm like constantly uh, sneezing, so excuse me this morning if I'm sniffling and sneezing. Um, in your bulletins, uh, the sermon title is entitled Real Talk, Amen. Real talk. Uh, we just came off of a student week of prayer with uh, Thunderbird Academy. Shout out to my Thunderbird students out there. Uh, <laughs> all over here. Um, and uh, we, we had a pretty successful week of prayer. So the student week of prayer is pretty unique because what we're supposed to do is have students speak for that entire week. And um, we kind of got the idea talking to some of the school pastors, like, we want to talk about topics that are relevant to us, Pastor Zach. I was like, okay, what's that? Like, we want to talk about, like, weed. Okay. <laughs> Which of you guys is going to talk about that? I don't know, Pastor Zach, but there's somebody. Okay. We also want to talk about weed, and we want to talk about the birds and the bees. And I was like, okay. Um, I was like, how are we going to—I don't know— what student is going to talk about the birds and the bees? Um, it was a little bit, it, it was unique, but they, what I got is they actually wanted to talk about real things, things that were important to them, um, things that were more relevant to them, um, which I agreed with because oftentimes we go into this mode where we, we just preach to people or we teach them about things and we believe that educating them about this one thing is going to change them and everything. But as Isaiah 118 says, we need to reason about it. We need to come together and talk about it. So we came up with real talk. So what we did is um, we kind of set the stage. We had uh, chairs spread out, and we kind of did like a panel. So instead of having students speaking on it, we, had them, we invited them in on the conversation so they could share about it. And we brought in adults and experts from our surrounding community to share. And man, some powerful things happened this week. Amen, students? Um, it was some cool stuff. Tears were shed. Um, I think relationships healed. There was a lot of things that happened just from coming together and talking about things. I think one of the hardest things to do is to talk about what is actually happening. We'd rather gloss over it. We'd rather move past it. But scripture says what we're supposed to do, it's even biblical in the book of Matthew, we need to address it. Time after time in scripture, God would send prophet. He would send king. He'd send all sorts of people to address these issues with them. He said, please, I, I, I want to talk to you. I want you to uh, hear me. Listen to me. So we'll be in Isaiah chapter 1 this morning. Um, I invite you guys to turn with me there. In Isaiah chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 2 to kind of pick up on what is, uh, what is happening here. So Isaiah chapter 1, looking at verse 2. Um, the word of the Lord says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Meaning they don't listen to me. They've turned, them they turned their backs on me. And this is what's really interesting. Uh, verse 3 and 4. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, and my people have not considered. Meaning, it gets so bad that Israel, not only are they not listening to God, but God has to illustrate to them that the animals listen better than they do. Meaning, the ox knows who its master is. And the donkey knows from which, where it came. It knows its parents and it listens to them. But you, O Israel, I have created you. I have taken care of you. I have fed you. I've caused the red, I, I parted the Red Sea for you. I've saved you. And 
you're not listening to me. You don't hear me. Can any parents relate this morning? Amen. Any teachers in here? Amen. Um, I think it could be a real thing where it's like we do all that we can for those that we love, and it seems to be that they're still just not listening. But why? I've done everything. I've talked to them. I'm there for them. Why aren't they listening? Um, God kind of begins to get to the heart of the, the stubbornness of um, everything that's happening. Verse 4, he says, You are a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. You guys are a brood of vipers, children who are corruptors. You have forsaken the Lord. You have provoked him to anger. The Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backwards. He's telling them everything that they're doing. And verse 5 is really eye-opening. He says, why should you be stricken again? You will just revolt more and more. What I have been doing has not been working. The whole head is sick. Your whole heart faints. Verse 6, from the sole of your foot even to that of your head, there is no soundness or reason in all of it. But there are wounds, there are bruises, there are petrifying sores. They have not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. You don't realize that you need me to help you. But verse 5, why should you be stricken again? Meaning, the way I used to discipline you, what I used to do for you, doesn't even anymore help you. You are helpless, you are laid open, there are sores all over you, and I really want to take care of you but you don't heed me. Even the animal listens better to me. I remember uh, growing up, I used to get in trouble for everything. I was a terrible kid. I flunked the first grade. I, first grade, I flunked the second grade. That's why I, I don't know my vowels and stuff. Um, that was a hard time in my life. Um, I wasn't rebellious as much as I was a talker in class. Like, it was just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally more of an introverted person, like on the one-to-one -one, um, situation, or, you know, in, in Large groups, I'm a little bit more introverted. One-on-one, -one, I'm, I'm more comfortable. But I remember um, I was always disruptive in class. And I didn't mean to be. I was just super talkative. I would talk to all the people around me. Love your neighbor, right? Amen? Yeah. Just fulfilling biblical commandment, loving those people who are important to me. And so... Uh, I would always get in trouble. I remember in uh, first grade, the teacher had those little things like at the end of the day where you would move your marker. Like if you were a green light, you were going, you were amazing. If you were on the yellow one, well, there's a warning. You're maybe talking in class. If you're on the red one, you need to stop. You're being pulled over. All sorts of things are happening. I was always on red. Um, it's just how it happened. And I remember one day, I was getting a little bit older. I think I was like sit, I was like probably like seven or eight, and I am pretty sassy. My students know this about me. I can be pretty sassy. Um, I don't know why. I get it from my mom. Um, my mom one time we were cleaning the house. So I was a bad student, not bad, just crazy. And we were cleaning the house one time, and I disrespected my mom. I said something to her, because my mom would get sassy, and I would get sassy with her. Um, so I talked back to her, and my mom tried to discipline me. So she did the whole, she put me over her legs, she reached out her hand, and she was spanking me. Okay? She was going at it. Now, I had a realization. It doesn't hurt anymore. It didn't hurt anymore. What used to hurt me and work for me now does nothing to me. And my mom, and I was kind of doing the fake crying thing, like, oh my gosh, it hurts so much. Mom, please spare me. Uh, be merciful. I was like acting like I was crying, and my mom picked up on it really quickly. She looked at me, and she goes, Zach, you are faking this. And I was like, you are absolutely right. Um, it did not hurt me at all. And she just kind of like threw me off her lap, and she's like, well, just don't be who you are anymore, and we'll be okay. And uh, we kind of move on from that. So um, that was like the first sign in my life where I was like, I am strong. Like the spankings don't work anymore. Um, except with my dad. Um, he had a bigger hand. Um, I still feared him. Uh, but God is going to Israel and he says, should you be stricken again? What I have been doing for you no longer works for you. I've put you into captivity. I've done all sorts of things, but nothing matters to you. Like, nothing works anymore. What used to work doesn't work, and I don't know what I am supposed to do with you. It hurts him. He's bothered by it. 
because he tells them there's no soundness in you. What you're doing make no sense. There, it makes no sense. You, there's wounds and bruises, and I want to I wanna help you. As a matter of fact, verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers have devoured your land in your presence. It's desolate. It's overthrown by strangers. So the daughter um, of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, a hut in a garden of cucumbers. People are taking advantage of you. You are a besieged city. Unless, verse 9, the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. The only reason why God doesn't pour out the rest of his judgment upon them is because there was a small group of people that are still faithful to him. One thing I want you to walk away with this morning is even though it seems like your faithfulness may be doing nothing, you never know. It was the faithfulness of a small remnant that was protecting still a whole city. It was the faithfulness of a small remnant that kept God's patience going. Even though at times it seems like your faithfulness, our faithfulness is doing nothing, you never know. God is still protecting. He's still reasoning. He's still calling. Isaiah says, if it wasn't for this faithful remnant still there, we would have been like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. We wouldn't exist today, but there's still a people being faithful. Amen? They're still hoping. They're still working. They haven't given up. They haven't given up. They're still trying, the Bible says. Now, the most unique thing, jumping down to verse 18, God's command to Israel. I don't want to discipline you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to get physical with you. Verse 18, I want to reason with you. Come now, let us reason together. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. I think, as I was kind of thinking about this um, yesterday, um, I think back to the war that happened in heaven with the devil and with God and all that stuff that broke out in heaven. Um, I wonder for a moment if Lucifer instead of rebelling against God, thinking that he was better than him, I wonder what would happen if Lucifer would have reasoned with him. I wonder what would happen if Lucifer had, got, Lucifer had gone to him and say, look, I don't feel like this is fair. I want to be included on what is happening. I don't want to be mistreated, excluded, like I'm not important. I want what, I wonder if he had been real with him, really talked with him, if things would have gone down differently. But instead, the Bible says, Lucifer questioned him, cast doubt upon him, and got another group of people, another group of angels, to be deceived into thinking that God didn't really want what was best for him. Instead of really talking with them, the Bible says in Revelation that there was a war that broke out between them. And the, the, the Greek word for that word, war, isn't like this actual war where there's like swords and guns and there's this actual physical battle going on in heaven. Um, the Bible uses that word war to signify a political war. There was a disagreement. There was no space found anymore for them. Um, Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. There was a disagreement on the word. They couldn't come to agreement with each other. There was a, there was a disagreement um, that was happening. I remember growing up, um, when I was uh, when I was younger, um, I uh, I did not agree with my family. Um, specifically, when my when my parents divorced, I didn't know what to think anymore. My mom, I'm just gonna keep it 100 this morning, real talk, amen. Uh, I'm just gonna keep it real this morning. Uh, my mom was very, at least according to my dad's opinion, uh, very controlling of everything that was happening to me. Um, I'll be real about it this morning. Uh, my mom is uh, manic depressant, schizophrenic. She struggles with a lot of different things. And so m growing up, my dad saw my mom be specifically controlling with me. So when my parents split, um, when they divorced, when I was about 12 years old, my dad got custody of me. And my dad looking at me, when he, he told this to me, he was like, I just wanted to give you the freedom that I felt like you never had. So I kind of just let you go and I let you do anything. I didn't want you to get in trouble and to get caught up in the things that you got caught up into, but I felt like you were being so, so controlled. I wanted to give you the freedom to do, um, 
to, uh, to live freely, to do what you actually want to do. And that kind of left a number of consequences in my life. Um, I remember I started rebelling against him. I know my dad had, like Isaiah 1, he wanted some good things for me, but I was rebelling against him. I didn't want the plans that he had for me. And long story short, there was a situation, as I look back, that really stood out to me about my parents and the good that they wanted for me. Despite me not wanting them and despite my dad, the best intentions that he had for me, me not respecting him or listening to him, um, I remember thinking that my dad really didn't want what, what was best for me. Um, I was hanging out with my friend. His name was Luis, Luis Atello. This guy influenced me in all different sorts of ways. I never really knew him, but I wanted to be friends with him. I went to a public school in the sixth and seventh grade, and this kid was like the, the coolest guy ever. He was a skateboarder. Everyone loved him. He was cool. Um, so I wanted to hang out with him. As a matter of fact, I wanted to be like him. So I surrounded myself with him. And one thing that I noticed that was different with him different with him than me, is that he actually had complete freedom in everything. For example, I had a curfew. I had to be home by 9 p.m. My friends, no curfew. As a matter of fact, the parents weren't even ever home. They were always having house parties, hanging out all the time. They would call me on a Monday morning saying, Zach, we're not going to go to school today. Come hang out with us. My dad, no, you're going to school. So I so badly wanted to be like him. I thought to myself, this guy is the guy. I want to be like him. I want to, I want to do life like him. So one day I hung out at his house. I went over to his house, and uh, his brother was a part of a, I guess, a graffiti. You can call it a graffiti organization, or we call it a crew. Um, it was one of the biggest ones in Las Vegas, Nevada. As a matter of fact, they had connections with this crew called DOC, which stands for Destroying Our Cities or Doctors of Crime. They're a big graffiti, kind of a gang organization, both in Las Vegas, Nevada, and also in LA. Um, they're notorious um, in Arizona, or, sorry, in Las Vegas, Nevada. They built this, um, this freeway system called the Spaghetti Bowl. And they call it a spaghetti bowl because it's like these bunch of freeways kind of like all overlapping each other and it looks like a big bowl of spaghetti, amen? And um, what they did is they went up and they just tagged, they graffitied the entire freeway, all of it, newly built. So they were notorious, they were on the news. Well, my friend Luis, his brother had associations with them. He was big, like we looked up to him, we're like, we want to be like them. These guys were talented artists. So long story short, I'm at their house. And I want to see what a day in his life is like. I want to be like him. So I'm hanging out with him. And all of a sudden, as we're hanging out, it's early in the morning. No one's eating. I'm hungry. He's hungry. His brother comes home from work um, pretty early, and he has breakfast for them. Fast food. Uh, Burger King. He's kind of giving them food. Then something shocking happens to me that I see. They're like, where's mom? Well, I'm I don't know where mom is. Dad's not there, obviously. Dad's gone. He's working somewhere. Gone. Um, but... They're like, I don't know, we haven't heard from her. Well, mom comes in, and this is, this is real talk. This was shocking to me. Mom comes in, and her hair is just like matted and like greasy, like she slept outside or something. She like, she looked like she smelled. Like I didn't, like I couldn't see if she smelled, but you know when you see someone, they look like they smell. Um, she looked like she smelled. She looked very just like, not like a mom, like she just woke up. She was like in a dress, like she just came back from a party. She was like in her probably mid-40s. She was a bit older and she kind of staggered into the house and it got very quiet. We're just kind of all looking at her and she goes to one of her sons. She says, where's my food? Where's my breakfast? And the son says to her, where's our mom? Meaning we could have all had breakfast as a family, but you're passed out in your car down the street from a party. There's no food here at home. So I brought food from work with what money we did have and what food I could get for free to feed everybody. But you're not here, you're doing nothing. And she just kind of laughed at it and the way they treated her was really shocking. And I thought to myself, never once have I gone hungry Never once has my dad not been there for me. Never once when I came home has my mom not had a meal cooked and ready for me. I had a family that actually loved me, but I want to be like this stranger who's offering me nothing? 
the stranger who's going through his own things that I'm not even understanding, God is telling Israel, you don't understand what you're doing. These strangers that you want to be like, they're taking advantage of you. They're hurting you. They don't have any good intentions with you. He's trying to help them. He wants to. He says, let's reason together. I want to reason with you. I want to work with you because I actually have great plans and things in store for you. Um, it was probably several months ago. Um, I think I was preaching here at this church in the summer. Um, and my dad came to visit me. Um, he came to listen to me speaking. And afterwards, he, he hang out, him, him and my mom, um, my stepmom. Um, my stepmom was actually, I asked for prayers for her. She's in the hospital this morning. Um, she's not doing too bad. There's a blood pressure issue. So um, I found that out this morning. But she, um, they both came to church and we hung out afterwards. And me and my dad had real talk afterwards. It was weird. I never like, me and my dad, we just don't, we don't share emotions. We don't share feelings. It's like not a thing. Um, so me and my dad were kind of hanging out, and my dad said, you know, Zach, I, I told my dad, I'm sorry for the way I lived as a kid. I'm sorry for the hard times I gave you, all the times you had to pick me up from the police station, all the times you had to do those things for me. And my dad said, you know what? I'm sorry. He says, I'm sorry that I actually didn't spend more time with you. I'm sorry I didn't try more to reason with you. I'm sorry I wasn't more patient with you. I'm sorry, Zachary, that I didn't spend more time with you. My dad had developed this thing that was super funny, I thought, when I came from, it was in between me leaving Thunderbird and going to PUC. He developed this thing called an hour of power. I thought it was the lamest thing I've ever heard of. I come home and my, my two sisters, Marilyn and Taylor, are like, today's our hour of power. I'm like, what's an hour of power, you loser? Like, what is that? Like, what is an hour of power? We get an hour of power with dad. And I'm like, what? Like, what is that? It's when we get a full hour with dad and we get to do anything that we want to do. I was like, what? They're like, yeah, like, I'm going to go shoot guns today. I'm like, what? Uh, my, dad, my dad owns some weapons, so my, Taylor, my sister Taylor was super into, you know, guns and shooting, so they would go out to the shooting range and shoot. And I was like, Marilyn, what are you going to do? She's like, well, we're going to go out to eat. We're going to go eat today for our hour of power. And I'm like, I want to eat. Well, I, I want an hour of power. And so my, my stepmom comes to the kitchen. She's like, yeah, Zachary, it's super exciting. I don't know what God is doing with your dad, but things are happening. He's like, he, he, he's wanting, because we had a big family. He's, he wants to spend time with you guys. And she said, he developed this thing called an hour of power where there's, there's, I have seven siblings, so there's eight of us um, together. And she goes, he wants to, um, he's making a promise that he wants to spend an hour once a week with each of you. And you get that soul hour with him. You can do anything with him, an hour of power. You can just talk and hang out, anything. And I was like, well, where's my hour of power? Um, and as I begin to look, about, uh, look back on that, me and my dad, we did spend a lot of time together. We did talk. But that was the thing that ultimately began to change me, is him sitting down with me, him hanging out with me, him reasoning with me, actually began to do something inside of me. It began to change me. In Isaiah 1, verse 18, God says, Come, let us reason together. Come with me. Come spend time with me. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Come to me. Let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. I will help you. I will heal you. I will change you. Verse 19. This is beautiful. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. It's a growth process. God doesn't just demand this of us. He reasons with us gives us the desire to make us willing to do it, and gives us the capability to be obedient, to do what he wants for us so we can experience the life that he has for us. All God wants to do is reason with us. But some of us are stubborn, amen? How many of you are stubborn this morning? You don't have to raise your hand, I'm just messing with you. Um, I think some of us are so stubborn that what God is saying in Isaiah Two and three, that these animals who know their own masters better than we know our own heavenly father, they know to go to them to ask. We don't. In Numbers chapter 22, there's this prophet, Balaam, who gets on a donkey, completely disregarding God's word, what he had said to him. 
God is coming up to stop him because he wants to help him. He strikes the donkey three times. The donkey gets angry at him. Then this donkey, who is the, he, the reason why the donkey gets angry at him is because the donkey is trying to save him. He sees the angel and he's trying to protect him. And Balaam says, if I had a sword, I would strike you down and kill you. And now the donkey's reasoning with him, actually talking with him. Now who's crazy, right? He's reasoning with a donkey. And here's what's crazy. A donkey is considered a stubborn animal, and yet the donkey is more willing than he is. Of which God says to Moses, you are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. Even this donkey was willing to reason with him. And all the donkey says is, I've been good to you this far. I'm just trying to protect you. I'm actually just trying to help you. All God wants to do with us is reason with us. If we can be real with him, if we can tell him where we're at with him, we can experience the healing and the joy that comes in obeying him, in being in relationship with him, amen? But the problem is, and the reason why we never get there, is because we're never really real with him. We brush over issues like they mean nothing to him. We think of sin as this thing that God is supposed to just forgive us of instead of him actually wanting to heal us of. I think about it like this. I always hear this verse, 1 John 1, verse 9. Everyone always says it this way. Um, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. So if you confess it, he'll forgive it. Amen? We believe it. But the rest of that verse says he wants to cleanse us from it. He wants to completely heal us of it. He doesn't want to just forgive us of it. He wants to completely rescue us out of it. But that can only come, Isaiah 118, as we reason with him. Then your sin shall be like snow. You will be cleansed. You will, you, your iniquity will be free. Verse 18, if we reason together, your sins will be like scarlet, or your sins that are like scarlet will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come talk to me. Come hang out with me. Be real with me, reason with me, and you'll begin to experience what it means to actually do life with me, to live with me. Amen.